That's out of the way. So this um, it started with, this is a bit of a midnight keynote um, PowerPoint thing, only because I've tried to be responsive to the conversations and, and try and be inclusive in terms of some of the work I've done in the past, but try and talk about some of the activities I do with Arthi and um, a current project we're working on. And it picks up from really a conversation yesterday, which I was clued into this idea of where is the present and how does the how does the model and I'm not very good at separating model map from experience. I just I don't think I've got that. Whatever happened, it didn't work for me in the physics lessons. I just took it literally. And when the mathematician said there's infinite lines in a circle, I just didn't really get that. For me it's just a circle. So I was a perpetual model in actual. Um, but clearly if you talk about um, time, if we use that thing in terms of models of time, the Western Christian model of time assumes some arrow, it talks about teleology, and it assumes some idea that we have a start and a middle and an end to most of the narratives, certainly models of time. And if we look toward the arrow, we can assume there's some judgment day, there's some kind of closure, be it global warming, be it disasters, but we're perpetually writing toward this arrow. So the arrow retains, we haven't lost the arrow. What was interesting, in, I think, in the conversation for me, is the beginnings of perhaps this term, certainly I think in phylogeny, we're having to look back is to do with um, reflecting back and perhaps understanding something called provenance, something you know is where things come from. So as opposed to being obsessed with where we're going, which the Microsoft adverts of the past used to be where do you want to go today? And technological determination and being interested in technology often encompass with it a sense of we want to go somewhere. Um, and phylogeny for me has already begun to start shifting the idea of this reflection, and that's connected to a series of works we're doing at the moment, particularly with memory. The, um, the other question is then, where is the present? And this is where it gets very interesting, because the present, then, you know, that we're, at that, we're at some, well, the, these maps, or these diagrams, give us an idea of the cold face, the idea of the present is somewhere at that moment. Now, this is where I think it gets a bit more complicated, though, because while I can, in the conversation about the, the wood lice, I accept that, and I do, I realise that it's a dinosaur, no, it's part of my time, it's in the present. Um, and I feel that, I won't show these, but there's a couple of pieces of work I made well, a long time ago, which I won't play for very long, but they try to talk about present, social and, cultural dispositions and people present understand. of place, and place, and present of time. And this was a street in Plymouth, where everything's at the same scale, but as soon as you ask uh, members of the public, what they remember and what they use in their present landscape, you actually get very different things. This chap uses Lois TSB, but he doesn't use that shop. He uses this bar, but he doesn't go to this bar. So you begin to get, and it's just a bar graph, um, but it, at the time it allowed me to see that hosts of different communities in a kind of Pierre Bourdieu model of habitus, that we all have different presents. You know, the, the landscape of the present can't just be the phylogenetic map allows us to see it for everybody, but for individuals, it just can't be that, the cold face can't look that vertical. Um, and then a year later, myself and Dan Harris then try to do it with time, so that while place and space can be aggregated, um, you can also do it with time lapse. So we shot a time lapse in the same street in Plymouth. Um, but what we did was we counted how many people entered each of the shops in an hour based on an average. So the post office is quite busy, 65 people per hour. Um, there's a charity shop that drops to 34 people per hour, and it goes along and so on and so forth. And then if you, if you then place those into what we call the space lap, in other words, you play them simultaneously, you, you remind yourself that actually the street then is occupying, again, a multiple temporality, that some things aren't working all the time in the present. Some places are very slow. Some places are very fast. The news agent, the tiniest place, turns out to be the fastest, and it gets the fastest social impact. In fact, it's decaying. So this idea then of time and how we use phylogeny as perhaps a framework to look back, but how then do we model the present? Seems interesting. You guys are all rotting and dying at different speeds. So although we have an idea of the now, actually we're all falling apart, speak <laughs> for myself, um, very, you know, we're not all going to die at the same time, even though we have models of history which allow us to talk about these collective times and these events. Um, 
And my, I was talking to my, we were driving in this morning, and he said, oh, flat, uh, speed camera, whoa, okay. And I was decided to see a vent, and it didn't flash. But he was also talking about the M4. At the M4, you've got these, what are they called? <coughs> Average speed cameras now. So it, it sets off from Taunton, Somerset, and if you go through Bristol, you go through three or four of them, it takes your average. So already we're talking about events, which are starting to be, it's not just the bang, bang, gotcha. It's a whole kind of event that's stretched out. So if we talk about landscapes then, when I, I'm fairly new to Edinburgh, and it came clear that actually those, that, that whole face of the present, I keep trying to refer to that as a face, it clearly is very distorted, because it becomes a deeply romantic Disneyland, and it's beautiful, I'm really thoroughly enjoying the Rebus narratives, um, the other ghost stories, um, the power relations, the Parliament, the Royal, the, the, the Royal Mile, and the Old Town, and the New Town. But it is a landscape in which you really get this kind of complex histories. Now, I don't think actually it's as complex as places like Plymouth, which you get bombed and wiped out. Here they're preserving it, so but you get this aggregation. Now, this idea, this um, aggregate is the right word, but this kind of aggregation of this complexity. This, historical bumps are quite interesting because you begin to talk about some events. Now the city again doesn't live in the present, I don't think, because actually we have a lot of people, I office faces the castle, and I see a lot of people turn up and you see flashes going off all through the day. And I think what they're doing, I don't think they're in a present, I think they're photographing ideas of Edinburgh, how they want to see it according to models of history. So you see them framing and they get rid of Evolution House, which is a 2007 building, and they frame the city in the same way that we want to inhabit the city, that we frame time. Um, and you get this idea of then ghosts, you get this idea of histories being hidden, hidden. and it's no longer a, a city that operates at the same time. So the tourists are clearly occupying the city through rose-tinted models of the past. Um, there's something that happens in November, which I thought was very interesting to kind of talk about how the city tries to deal with these shifts in time, to demonstrate and keep banging home this idea of aggregated time, diverse time. This is the Haymarket before they started work on the junction, before they started deciding to put the tram lines down, and it has this war memorial just right in the centre, and you might remember it, in fact it might for you be a ghost now, because it's gone. Um, and they stripped it away in order to get ready for the... Um, the tram lines. But something happened on the 11th of the 11th, at the 11th hour, was that we tried to remember both it and the war. So you had this very peculiar memorial. The memorial actually is enough to string up some fence, but the fence is irrelevant. What's more important is the idea of remembrance and the fact that they're actually strung to a ghost. It doesn't exist anymore. They've moved it, and I'm sure they'll replace it very carefully. But what happened at the moment is this kind of recovery of a landscape at which, socially, we're, re we're so compelled, we don't actually need architectures to have a palace, a memory palace of life. Well, actually, as long as that piece of ground, the memory is that important in November, that will actually evoke an invisible architecture to retain that memory. And it, again, the city seems to be doing that. This is how Haymarket's used to look, and again, it's some kind of um, ghosting. And there it is again. Now, in terms of trying to, I think this is an idea of ghost then. How can I use, I've been interested in ghosts. And Steve Pyle um, is a radical geographer, whatever that is, that's what they call himself. And I just want to spend some time talking about ghosts, because I think these might be metaphors or ways to understand these aggregations in history or aggregations in the landscape. And we talked about it in the room upstairs yesterday, but what this place does, where the um, uh, the garden keeps moving around. They seem to be ideas of playing out different people's ghosts. I'm just going to read this, because this is Avery Gordon, which pile signs. The ghost is not simply a dead or missing person, but a social figure, and investigating it can lead to that dense site where history and subjectivity make social life. The ghost or the apparition is the form of which something is lost, or barely visible, or seemingly not there to our supposedly well-trained eyes. It makes itself known or apparent to us in its own way, of course. The way of the ghost is haunting, and haunting is a very particular way of knowing what has happened or is happening. Being haunted draws us effectively, sometimes against our will, and always a bit magically, into the structure of feeling of a reality we come to experience. Not as cold knowledge, but as transformative recognition. And I think that's my contemporary model of landscapes, that we go through, and as I walk with you guys through the park and with Gerhard, 
there's a host of different ghosts being uncovered because I'm walking with you lot. If I walk with my kids and my wife, there's a series of other ghosts that become uncovered. Some of them are left, but some of them are revoked. I'm going to try and explain further what I mean. Steve Pyle, in his trying to talk about ghosts then, cited an example at which, again, this, this kind of recovery of the past comes thrown into a kind of contemporary subjectivity that we call landscape, this idea which is perhaps up here. In 2000, 1999, no 2000, there was a huge anti-capital march in London enormous and it was pre-2001 clearly but it was just it was deep in that anti-capital it was when those discussions were going to war um, but we'd never gone but it was that that moment of kind of anti-capital and what happened was there was a host of graffiti you probably remember if you've seen culture they um, they put a piece of turf on Winston Churchill's head and he made him look like a punk so they evoked the 1970s a ghost popped up and it was quite yeah, it was quite humorous what they also did, or people did, was they, on a war memorial, they graffitied two toilet doors. And this is a re re reconstruction. And they drew two toilet doors on a memorial. I don't know which one, but it was a war memorial. And Pyle talks about the idea that in that moment, well, the next day, The Guardian ran a huge cover. And it was all over the papers that in a reaction to the anti-capital, whilst McDonald's got smashed and Starbucks got smashed, this is the thing that captured the attention of the public. That how can you, okay, you have a, you have a problem with a capital system, but you don't desecrate the past. You don't go near those ghosts. And Paul suggested that in that moment, when that print was published, thousands of ghosts from the war walked back into the public consciousness. That which we'd forgotten about. And it was May, it was May the 1st. So you don't, you don't remember the war at that moment. What you remember is working and the value of the worker. But thousands of ghosts walked through that. So suddenly the landscape, which was a, is a consciousness-based thing, wasn't about there. This was obscure, no one had seen this. In the November, that, that object, that piece of landscape, means something, but in May it didn't. So ghosts seem to be a very interesting way of perhaps helping me understand how do you negotiate landscapes if we have maps, phylogenetic maps, as well as um, experience in the landscape. And ghosts, then, if I carry on with ghosts, ghosts, I think, are very interesting in terms of helping me reconcile, perhaps connect into the future. I won't play all this. This is um, The Orphanage, which is the scariest movie on the planet. It's just a pants off me. Um, but what, it, what they do in it, and I'll just turn it on, it's about a woman who loses her child in a house. And essentially the house is an orphanage and it's gone through some trauma and children are lost in that house for various reasons. Um, and what she, in order to get to her child, she has to pass to the other side to get. But the house is the ghost, the ghost is the architecture. It's very complicated because the architecture doesn't have to change, it's just a scary haunted house. But in doing so, she has to go to her, to evoke it. And what she does, she does a number of things to connect. She dresses up and she performs a series of um, rituals to get the children back and it doesn't work the first time she she reenacts um, making them a meal and she does these various things and it only starts working when she starts to play as soon as she starts to play she she gets angry and it doesn't work she gets upset and she goes to play and then suddenly she clicks I'll play and then suddenly she plays a game and what happens at this point I think is she actually evokes a, a temporal thing in kids but the kids, can't turn up any loud. She starts to play um, for me, which is um, what is it? Knock knock. Yeah, knock knock. Uh, or Mr. Wolf, hi Lindsay. No. What's the time, Mr. Wolf? What's the time, Mr. Wolf? It's a kind of a Spanish or Portuguese play on the word that.
slowly, one by one. It's, it's terrifying, but it's wonderful. And it's deeply actually quite riveting and upsetting, because actually she's finding children through play. And what I think, I think what ha what's going on here, and I think we're using, children are used throughout movies, <coughs> horror movies in particular, as this innocence to do with time. They don't have maps. In fact, as I watched my kids take part yesterday, <coughs> they don't have a temporal model. They barely understand history. They barely understand yesterday or last weekend. Really, seriously. So when we have these huge, I'm looking at a tree over there, the trees, it's quite complex and it's in terms of time. So you have this temporal naivety, absolute innocence. So when we want to use ghosts, they're perfect. They're the perfect conduits, children, because A, they play, but when, if you remember Sixth Sense, as the little boy tells his mum, I can see ghosts. And we can see, they, that's what they're for. The device is the child. And it's not really about the child, it's about their innocence and their temporal innocence. The fact that they can move through play and through gaming and connect with a whole lot of non-institutional structures. So, so, so what? Well, if we evoke another example from this, is the classic is Poltergeist, in which actually it's the child becomes the medium, but the medium is also the TV. And it seems that TV, particularly this idea of connecting to spaces, and unfortunately I can't get the clip of the touch, because it's the touch in this where she's playing, and she plays at night. If you remember, she's in bed, they're a bit freaked out. Um, but as she touches the TV, she begins to evoke and allow these things, allow the poltergeist, the ghost, to transfer. But if you remember what polter a poltergeist was all about, it was a rupture in landscape. That a developer had decided to build on a graveyard, which was a landscape of the past, and then he decided, he was so confident about this, this new housing estate, he decided to live there himself and bring the family in. But in doing so, it was a ghost story, it was a rupture in the landscape. It was a fold, if you like. And what happens is the child acts as this conduit again through TV as an opportunity to touch. And Carol Ann, she's great, she's, she's innocent, she's white, she's the kind of that purity, but she becomes through play this conduit for communication in the past. So, I won't go much further that, but it appears to be this. This is your contemporary. This is the touch. This is where touch is gone. So whilst we don't need to touch the TV screens, we're now touching every place. And the iPhone particularly operates as this kind of touch, this swipe technology in which we touch. And the landscapes in which we're touching now, these are the travel apps, the travel applications which you can use on the iPhone, suddenly allowing us to connect to histories very much in the present. So as we walk through places, we're carrying around a lot of networks which allow to get to ghosts very, very quickly. So we've, and one of the projects we're doing at the moment is simply that. We've tried to hack out all of the Google Maps which are underneath and just simply that with a, an iPhone application, replace it by dropping in historical maps. So there's an application in my pocket. If I, I can walk through the botanics in 1850 now. And in doing so, it isn't a question of just history the desire to walk through historical maps. It's a play on the ghost that actually many of us do walk, as I say, the tourists through Edinburgh, sustaining this idea that there is a rose-tinted idea of London, Liverpool, and you'll get these tourists. I'm going to Liverpool next week, and I've already checked out the tours. The tours are the Beatle tours. So people are, are clearly moving through landscapes as though they're building their, their idea or evoking their own ghost stories. And in walking through time, we allow people just to kind of extend that, and it's become quite a good touchstone, these kind of strange devices. Um, the thing is, it's not, while that at the moment, just like Carol Ann, the TV was an interesting medium, there's something even more profound, I think, is coming then. So, so far, what I've tried to do is suggest that the phylogenetic maps allow us to see the present, but the present is beginning to be ruptured, and it's being ruptured through digital media. The next generation of technologies are going to affect artefacts. At the moment, most of the artefacts in the room, and I say most, are largely disconnected from each other. And actually, they occupy the present. And the plastic cups and the paper cups are going to go in a bin. And they'll have lived in a present, and you could probably, they occupy a coalface. When, in the next, so the next 10 years, we're going to start tagging things, and Walmart are already starting doing it. Everything that, can I have your vitamin water? 
what we've used in the past are bar codes. And the bar codes have been groovy. They'll allow you to get the product line, the vitamin water, nailed. So it's okay. Perhaps you, Jack wants a vitamin water. That isn't enough, though. There aren't enough numbers on that barcode to document every object, which is kind of good because you just want to connect to a product line. But if they want to know where this product's actually been, and they don't want to know which bin it goes into, and they want to know, you want to know how temperature cooled it was in case this one fell out of the van and it happened to have been opened or it got hot, then they have to start adding tags, more complex tags. And they're doing it two ways. One, they're adding QR tags, which are kind of square, two-dimensional tags. These are one-dimensional. Or they're adding um, RFID, which is a small electronic tag to things. And they, yeah, Terminal 5 have got electronic tags on it. So every object within the next 20, 30 years will be tagged. So that means that actually what you're starting to do is not live in a sense of objects being in the present, a throwaway. Everything will now have a history. And it's being evoked through something called augmented reality in some ways. This is, re this is 1999, Fight Club. And our hero, who we know now, 10 years on, is a schizophrenic. But the premise of the movie is we don't realise in the schizophrenic space. He's, li he's living a schizophrenic life. But we don't know. We've got those two split personalities, Edmund Norton and Brad Pitt. What we're seeing is him walking through an environment, an augmented reality, where we begin to see the operation of schizophrenia, that he's having to live in a world where the present is also occupied with what his desires. But this, is, this schizophrenia is exactly the same as now with walking through time. I can give you a schizophrenic idea of the landscape. I can give you 1850 botanical gardens, or I can give you it now. So we're already getting this schizophrenia. The things in front of you, if when they start to be... Um, tagged, you're also going to get further more ruptures in this kind of experience of place. This is, this, this is, he's perceived as some devious, some trans, transgressive idea who's stealing and perhaps shoplifting a series of things. Well, he's not. In a tagged environment, there's no such thing as a cashier because we know where, where everything is all of the time. So there's no need to worry about surveillance. There's no need to worry about the presence or the past or the future of intentions. Everything is occupied. So everything becomes tracked. So actually, all they're worrying about here is there's a sinister portrayal of this guy, but he's just putting his objects in his pockets because when he walks through the scanner, it's already credited him. It's debiting him instantly. So there isn't any in the sense of being fearful of this place. There is lots of fear under, underneath, but we'll... So the, the, the reality is changing. We're involved in a project with Arthur and... Um, Jamie about the event yesterday, which is trying to tag these things. And at the moment, the problem is with the um, logistics that most of the objects unfortunately will be tagged with logistical data about where things come from. But I think I said on Friday, what we're trying to do is load them with different things, provenance to do with social memory. So what we're starting to do is look at landscapes such as, I'll just take you back to that, landscapes such as mantle pieces, which in some ways are landscapes just like the city, but actually all these on, um, objects on this person's mantelpiece are actually references back to different points of time. If the mum perhaps picks up the daffodil, that takes her somewhere. If it picks up the carriage clock, that takes somewhere, takes her somewhere else. So this becomes a landscape. So by loading these objects with different personal memories, we're trying to explore how, again, you rupture the experience of objects, not being something which is monitored according to surveillance or security or logistics. By asking people to tell stories of an object, you actually build a different idea of a different, entirely different landscape. So when you pick up objects of the future, which is my, um, my grandpa's slide case, which he's dead now and I've, I've inherited it, he didn't pass it on. But when I hold this now, this takes me to very different places because it evokes. So this is a ghost. This is the touch. At the moment, it doesn't do much. But if I tag it with an object, and then use a digital device to release that story, suddenly you'll get all of these objects. All of those objects will evoke stories. They might, might, they might evoke the fear of someone who's involved in Coca-Cola making expensive orange squash, or it might evoke stories from my grandpa. But as soon as you start using these touch, these TVs, which Carol Ann was using in Poltergeist, as soon as you scan that tag at the bottom, it brings up a story, and it'll get, it'll evoke a ghost story from the past. Um, just to finish, we're using this in the context of um, charity shops at the moment, because um, we think, actually, while well, the Museum of Scotland 
is a good storyteller for the past, actually only tells one or two stories, Scottish stories. So the idea is if we actually start loading up objects in a charity shop, the idea of those become social museums. If you walk through here with an RFID reader in a few years' time, or at the moment with your iPhone, you'll listen to people's stories connected to those artifacts. And it might be full of death. It's that weird smell you get in charity shops where you think, hmm, I wonder who died in that. But that's not a problem. A lot of the coalface of the present try at the moment to sustain that Christian Western model of the future, we try and hide the past. But what's wonderful for me about the weekend so far has been that this vertical present here, there's a series of technologies, a series of streams, a series of stories, which are beginning to ask us to, oh, hang on a minute, let's look at the provenance, let's look at the history of these things, where they came from, and who was involved in their making, uh, bringing into being. So, yeah. <laughs> Be careful what you pick up in the future. <laughs> Thanks very much. Please stop the camera now. Uh... <laughs> right, um, so we've got 10 minutes questions, 15 minutes questions, and then... How do you feel about uh, tagging humans? Um, yeah, good question, because in, um, in that present, I think what, I think what we've been talking about this weekend seems to be that we become this... Um, the transmitter or the, the surface with which to make memories make sense. So my cats don't walk around with iPhones worrying about ghosts. Eric came through at six this morning because he had a ghost, he had a nightmare. Cats didn't care and we had to care. So tagging the people doesn't really bother, it doesn't interest me at all because we have to, um, we're more important at being able to explain and explore the values of these things. So. Um, so I, I'm not too interested in people being tagged. However, I'm acutely aware that this project that we're doing has this other agenda, which we're kind of just putting to one side of it, which is to do with surveillance. A lot of people are more worried about tagging. Well, I'm interested in the idea of using it as a seance, a communal mass seance, um, which I think will help us explore value and history and relationships. There is a question of surveillance and the super panopticism of fear and tagging criminals and tagging people. So. Um, thanks for your lecture. The idea of human beings as decay and the concept of time. My question is about, it's not, it's not a question as, as much as it's a comment. Leibniz has a concept of the monad and his concept of the monad is say like um, particle of light, right? And it exists in a curve. But that curve is not sort of traced curve, it's sort of a beginning and an end at the same time. So quanta is almost the same, actually it's not almost, it's precisely the same thing as a human being. It's just that quanta is a lot quicker than a human. So essentially we're actually dead. So we, we are ghosts of ourselves. Because we embody the past. Because we embody the past trajectory. and the future. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was good. I didn't know how to finish this slide, really. Because I, if what I've done is try to pull the slide from the first slide into finished closure. But I wanted, really, if I had the time, to do a different map, which might have embodied that idea of trying to carry the baggage of the past, as well as having an idea of where we want to go. And I think, absolutely, I don't know how we... The great thing, I don't know how you draw that with arrows anymore. I don't think you can draw them. <laughs> I mean, because we all carry an idea of, as I said, around with language. I kind of know what I want to say in 15 seconds time, but I don't. I know where I want the conversation to go, but I don't yet know how to get there. So I'm even using a finger. So there is this intention toward. When you, I think when you become parents, it's acutely aware that when my parent, I was the prime, I was the eldest child. Now I've got one. I've been, I've had to step aside because he gets spoiled. My son does. I don't get cool presents anymore. There you go. But I'm carrying this future of him with, him with my care for him. But I've also got this length, this past thing going when I've realised oh, I've become my parent. So absolutely, I think we go. We're, we're apparitional, if you like. Sorry? We're apparitional. Yeah. Dawkins has a very interesting um, take on it. Richard Dawkins, the biologist. He says, there is no part of you that exists now 